Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, this webinar series on data science for environmental sciences, and it's the first webinar in 2023. So since we're still in January, so happy new year. And um, I'm delighted to present uh, our speaker, um, Marie Jezi Hortin. Um, I have never met Marie Jezi in person, but I don't know, remember, I don't know whether uh, Marie Jezi you remember, but I contacted you way back when I was at Waterloo. So we were trying to submit the joint proposal. So I'm a big fan of Marie Jezi's uh, project because um, her group, uh, is really one of the pioneers in using complex networks for um, ecological problems. And there are not so many groups. And it's really fundamental, transformative type of research. So um, Marie Jezin is trained uh, as ecologist and she has four main research areas spatial ecology, disturbance ecology, conservation, and spatial statistics. And as I said, um, she is a pioneer in bringing complex network methods and graph theory in the ecology. Okay, so thanks very much, um, Rizze, for agreeing to give a talk at our webinars. It's, it's, it's a great honor for us. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're muted, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just realized it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be talking to your group. Um, basically, um, I will bring you to the world of forest management and how with a group of uh, colleagues, and I will show that later on, uh, we've been proposing to integrate network theory, functional trait, to better uh, manage a forest giving a global change. And as illustrated now, uh, you can see that there's always been natural disturbance like fires, but also uh, we've been harvesting our forest. And those are the not the most important nowadays uh, disturbances as I will show you in a moment. So we'll, um, oops. I will uh, want to uh, show you the whole big picture that um, when we talk and model forest dynamics, we are more in that kind of uh, landscape scale, the meso scale, but processes at the other uh, lower scale, the stand level micro scales are crucial because they are the regeneration and all the microclimate and uh, successional pathways are crucial to uh, provide um, the forest that we need for our needs. Then, of course, there's nowadays the issues of uh, climate change and social economic uh, changes that will make some part of the globe using more one type of forest or another type of forest. So all those things are combined to provide the mosaic of forest as we see here. But a forest is individual trees, and each trees have different properties. And this is a bit what I would like to stress to you uh, now. So there's three main parts of the talk today. So first, the response of trees to disturbance. And here I include both natural disturbance and uh, human disturbance. And how we can see through um, plot data uh, over several years. Uh, how the species diversity change using a temporal beta diversity index. And this change is maybe uh, promoting species that are more deciduous trees that are adapted to more warmer condition, given climate change. Then how can we maintain our forests by uh, a management that combine a network approach of connectivity of forest stands and the uh, functional uh, composition within those stands by uh, functional traits. And I will put things all together if, 
into meta networks where I'm going to combine stems of forest and species interaction here. What I mean is more wildlife because uh, we always have the, main, the mandate to maintain biodiversity in our forest, at least here in Canada. So um, first, let's see how the forest has changed through time and uh, I'm bringing you to the province of Quebec. And here the purple uh, pixels are harvested stands and the yellow one is a forest that has been burned through time. And this is the work of a former PhD student, uh, Marie-Lène Brice, in collaboration with Pierre Lejeune. And um, the histogram just showed the amount of disturbance and the intensity of those disturbance in the period of time studied from 1985 to 2010 for that uh, map here. So there's different intensity and they will affect the regeneration, of course, of the forest. But as we know, uh, there's also a specific uh, response to species to climate change, and there's been an increase in the uh, growing season uh, uh, length, and the amount of uh, temperature and precipitation also have changed. So the goal of uh, Marie-Hélène thesis was to quantify the relative contribution of climate change and disturbance, so here both natural and uh, human disturbance, to the shift in tree composition over time. And we partition um, the time in two periods, the historical one from 1970 to 1980, and the more contemporary one from 2000 to 2016. And uh, so that was the first part. So we use for that a temporal beta diversity index. And then we look at how many of those new um, changes promote the shift of trees to those warmer, and warmer regions. So I'm bringing you to the province of Quebec where we have a, a lucky to have a 11, thousand permanent plots sampled through all those period of time. And their uh, plots are separate in different biomes. So sugar maple, balsam wood, uh, different kind of uh, more deciduous area and more uh, coniferous areas. So the numbers here in two parentheses, those are the number of plots that were available through those different time series that we are analyzing. So again, the goal is really to see, can we see some kind of change in species composition, giving or controlling for what we call the baseline is the temperature precipitation and the interval time uh, between uh, each plot has been resampled, but not exactly at the same frequency. So we need to correct for that. Then we are looking at the impact of a change in temperature, change in precipitation, the stand age, the um, intensity of harvesting, the intensity of uh, disturbance, mostly fire in this case. And we are using a beta uh, diversity index through time. So what is this uh, temporal beta diversity index? So here, uh, the little circle are different interval from a given species and there's different plots, different times. So let's say we just focus on the one plot at time one and time two. So our circle period of time and our um, contemporary one. And then we see are the pres species present in both times. So that's kind of um, no loss, no gain. And then maybe we had more individual in one case than another. So we're losing some species, some are maintaining themselves, some are gain, maybe deciduous trees arrive and so on and so forth. So we can tally the number of species uh, in the same plot that are the same in terms of composition, and then uh, those that we have lost and those that we have gained. So this uh, three index is uh, the way to as have this kind of uh, dissimilarity or beta diversity index of turnover. So if the value is close to zero, the community are quite similar. If it's close to one, there's a kind of really turnover and maybe no species in common from the two time periods. 
So given all those uh, permanent plots, we were able to assess uh, these changes and then also relate those changes to the presence or absence of disturbance. So here, let's first look at those panel here. So in blue is gain of forest, um, three, sorry, it's three really that we are talking about the species type. Um, so the gain of, of trees or loss of trees, and then we are trying to see, are they due to mostly disturbance? So here is a lot of colors, I'm sorry, but here what we're trying to see is separate the cases where there was no disturbance, moderate disturbance, or uh, major disturbance, very intense disturbance through this kind of latitude region from south to north. So basically what we are seeing is that the dark blue is gain of forest um, in the rural regions. And then we have lost of forest when it's pale blue. And we see that we're losing a lot of trees in the boreal forest when there's major disturbances and so on and so forth. So there's really through space and time, we can assess what is the proportion of disturbance that are promoting the gain or the loss or the turnover of species. So we can study that with uh, a multiple regression and variance partitioning, and then we can see what is the contribution to those uh, change and gain and loss of species. So basically, um, here all the model, I mean, this is ecology without explaining uh, too much the variability, but still to explain 40% of the variance at those broad scale is quite impressive with uh, the baseline information, the climate change and the disturbance. Then we have the same thing for the gain, we explain 30% and for the loss almost 30% as well. And the most important factor in all the cases that explain those changes or those maintenance or gain is the disturbance. So uh, 30%, 25 or 26% of the variability is due to the disturbance event and not climate change as people would uh, have uh, thought. So climate change, of course, it's important, but the disturbance have a major impact on the species turnover or gain or loss. So then, uh, because we are at the, the species level, we can look at tiny bit more which species are the winner and loser. So here you have all the Latin name, the T here is for temperate uh, zone, boreal zone. So we have different species that are in different location. And then I just put the black spruce here is kind of a loser. There's a loss of um, black spruce in some places. And then we have uh, the red maple that is taking over. The different colors is for the five uh, region that I bound that I showed you, some from south to north. So there's also differences depending in which biome you are. Some species don't change much, but this is, uh, if you're interested, you can see uh, the abundant change versus the compositional change. So that was uh, one part. The other part is to be able to see, well, how much um, we are replacing species by those that are more uh, adapted to climate that are warmer. So this is a index of, uh, I would say it only once, thermophilization. Um, so this is very a degree uh, per decade. So how much we are having species that are um, adapted at time one versus time two. So we do this differences and then we multiply by 10 just for the sake of uh, having better numbers to look at. And then when we look at uh, those different uh, turnover in terms of species composition and temperature index, what we find that the most uh, replacement, those values are very small, but uh, they are, uh, 
comparable from one region to another. And again, we separate them from region where there was no disturbance, moderate disturbance or major disturbance. And again, what we can see the confidence interval is the biggest in the moderate condition where there's the most replacement or change in species composition and replace by species that are more disease three. So the same kind of plot again, so we can see the decrease of some species and gain of certain species again in the different bowel. And here again, the basin fur is um, changing in all the directions, black spruce as well, but we are gaining definitely red maple and sugar maple throughout the um, five bowels. So to conclude this part, uh, what we found is that disturbers, disturbance uh, strongly modified the tree community to climate change. So it's not just climate change, but the disturbance and uh, the moderate ones and mostly harvesting facilitate the gain of warm adaptive species to uh, the northern condition and that um, the gain in species mostly through the maple. So this is a large scale study and what we are seeing is that the composition of the stand is changing and maybe the way to manage the forest is at the stand level. So that's bring me to this other part where we combine the network theory and functional traits so warmer um, climate required to have the more deciduous tree. So how can we manage to maintain the health of our forest for the year to come given climate change? So this is a map uh, of Canada where we can see in red, there's a lot of fires, of course, but there's also a lot of insect outbreaks of different types throughout the country. And um, this is definitely the broader scale, a little bit what uh, in the previous study, we didn't focus too much on the insect outbreak, but of course they are the most important disturbance that we are going to face in the year to come. So that's really at the tree level and at the stand level that we can do an action to prevent those uh, outbreaks of insect. But there's many other factors. So uh, here uh, with the review with Brian Sullivan, we are uh, showing that there's many interactions and uh, depending on the age of the forest, there could be more uh, problems with droughts and maybe there's kind of insect outbreaks. So there's many other factors that we need to consider. And this management maybe is more at the stand level where we can maybe manipulate tree composition to minimize drought effect or insect outbreaks. So with Christian Messi and others, we have been looking at how can we do this. And the easy way about is, of course, to do a silviculture when you can have some kind of prescriptive uh, harvesting that favor the succession of some species and not others. You can do in planting by uh, enrichment. So if a stand is, is lacking maybe deciduous tree, maybe you can implement some and you can do new plantation uh, in the landscape. So this is the silviculture aspect. So we are more at the stand level and you can see already that there's maybe a mosaic of different stand and how connected they are from one to another. And this is uh, definitely uh, crucial in the more temperate forests where we, this is Southern Ontario, where we have a lot of uh, small stands and agriculture areas and how to promote the turnover of species to make sure that we are maintaining healthy forests. So one could say, well, we can look at now those uh, forests in the term of a mosaic of stands and then each sign can be considered as a node in the graph theory, network theory. And then we can see how close and how far they are from one another. Can we have natural regeneration or do we need to have a, a, a lack of maybe forest so that we need to do plantations, so on and so forth. So the use of graph theory can give us some kind of notion of the size of the forest patches and their um, 
complexity and how they are um, working together in a net functional network, if you want. So back to uh, what Christian Messier and other uh, we were proposing is this kind of tool that's really at the stand level to favor a new species composition. And then look at the layout of those stand, stands in a network structure. So maybe we had this kind of network of forest stand. And if we were to add a forest uh, by stand by plantation, we will make the network more resilient in terms of uh, proximity for seed dispersal and seed composition and redundancy in diversity. So what we are going to focus on is functional diversity, redundancy, analysis, and connectivity. Then for uh, each species had different traits and how much they are different from one stand to another, we can compute this functional redundancy or diversity. So here, uh, maybe this first stand is high in diversity, but low in redundancy. And this one has both high uh, diversity and redundancy. So we can manipulate uh, by uh, enrichment what we want to our stand to look like. And then we can use a different modeling tool like Lenses and other modeling platform to implement different type of disturbance and different intensity of disturbance, harvesting, um, climate change, uh, temperature, uh, insect outbreak, and so on and so forth. So we can manipulate and test different scenario and see which species, if we were to plant them or enrich the existing stand, can we maintain the viability and the resilience of the system. So here is just to show you that there's two components. So there's the species properties or so functional traits, so the wood density, how are they tolerant, tolerant to drought, persistent to insect outbreaks, so on and so forth. There's many, many other functional traits here. I just show a few. So we can use that as the uh, functional ecology part in green here. And then we can look at the layout of the stand. So this is the connectivity, the centrality and modularity index that we can compute. So here each circle is a stand and we can see how connected they are, how distant they are from one another. Then we can have each uh, stand, we can see is it the, at the center of several other stands. So we call them the hub or connector. Uh, then this peripheral stand, and we can better assess the need of increasing by plantation and make the system more robust to disturbance and insect outbreak. And modularity is, is there maybe some kind of group of stand that behaves similarly, or is it just a mosaic, or is it just uniform or the property of the stand overall? So we combined that in an approach, and this was the thesis of uh, Nuria Ekuduli. And um, she looked at the region in Southern Quebec here, this little region, and this is the St. Lawrence uh, River that is at the north of the study area, and all the gray are forest region, the white is um, more agriculture, there's some big cities in this region. And then there are those circles where site visit of what was exactly the forest composition was performed. Here, we, I will present only two functional traits, the drought tolerance and the pest resistance, but uh, there was many other function traits that were present in her thesis, and uh, she looked at all of that. So the first uh, step was to have a layout of the forest stand. So if I just go back one moment, please. Uh, all this region was a huge connected region. This was some fragmentation, but overall this was a huge forest entity. And there were some other one and the very small one. So the size of the forest stand vary, which is represented by the circle that vary in size here. So the yellow is large uh, 
patches and the small one that we barely see are very small stem. Then the, uh, so that's the color. The size is the centrality, how it is a hub or not. So uh, this uh, big one uh, was also a hub and some were also uh, important in the connectivity and the movement of trees from one location location to another. And then the, we cannot see here, there's too many, but the uh, darker, more connectivity there was uh, between patches. The goal here was to say, can we um, have patches that are more close to one another and our uh, ruler was one kilometer. So of course, all the patches could have connection, but we were trying to see which one are the closest and that can provide seed uh, passive uh, regeneration from one location to another. Then the next step was uh, in the modeling framework is to say where should we giving this network of patches, where is uh, some patches missing? Maybe we can have new plantation or we can enrich some others. Maybe we can have some other uh, civic culture ways to improve either the drought or the diversity or the um, resistance to pests. So we have this kind of uh, outcome here. Uh, this is, uh, there's a lot happening here, so I would go slowly. Let's take this upper panel here. So this is uh, for looking at the impact of enhancing trees to resist to drought. So when we say drought is the reverse, is to help uh, this, the stand to be more resistant to drought, giving in blue those uh, three index of connectivity, centrality, connectivity, and modularity, and the two index of diversity and redundancy, functional redundancy. When we are in the civiculture uh, management, focusing on enrichment, the existing stand. So we're not creating new stand, we're just saying giving the existing one, uh, can we favor a condition that will promote better centrality, connectivity, redundancy, so on and so forth. Then there's different colors. So the blue color is at the starting of the simulation, what was in the landscape. So this is this kind of blue line here. And uh, this those radar plots where each um, uh, line is an increase of 25% of better condition. So there was not many modularity to start it, uh, not much centrality or a tiny bit more connectivity. So uh, a patch uh, for a stand at one kilometer about distant from one another. And there was not much diversity, but there was some kind of redundancy in the tree composition. So that was the initial condition. And then by having different improvement, 10%, 70%, or 40, sorry, sorry and 70% of uh, manipulation in the forest stand, we could see that we could move the condition to have more diversity, more centrality, connectivity, not modularity in this case for drought, uh, but we lost the redundancy. So there's always trade off, and this is what the simulation allows us to see by promoting trees that have those different properties. What can we have as a result? So this was for when we have the uh, stand existing and put the uh, trees that are resistant to drought versus plantation where there we can really play, uh, make the, the species composition the way we want uh, that will favor them to be resistant to drought. So here in this case, uh, again, we started with um, this uh, blue line that now is uh, kind of, uh, under the, the yellow one, I guess. And then this 10% was not sufficient to make it different in terms of composition. But then if we had more um, 
possibility to do replantation, 40%, 70%, then we could improve the diversity, we could improve the connectivity and minimize centrality. So there's always a trade-off, so that's why we need to do those things. So this was for focusing only on species for the drought. And then we look at the species that were resistant to pets outbreaks, so the non-host species, if you want. So again, we started with this blue line and by uh, improving the functional enrichment of the existing stem, we could move it to have more connectivity, centrality and diversity. And then the same thing for the plantation, uh, we could manipulate it to have better outcome. There was other uh, functional trait. We look also of improving biodiversity and there's some kind of trade off if you want to favor pest uh, control or drought resistance, then maybe the biodiversity was not uh, as possible. So in conclusion, um, we find that forest landscape can be represented as functional network, that the functional trait and the connectivity improve the resilience to a specific disturbance, and of course, not all of them. Functional enrichment, um, uh, functional poor stand was a win-win strategy, and it enhanced uh, functional diversity and connectivity. And uh, both stand enrichment and plant plantation help the forest to cope to pest outbreak and drought. So this is um, a case where we did manipulation of the trees and um, there's a lot of potential there. And we continue with another group to do this with uh, more complex disturbance and intensity. So that's bring me to the last part of this talk, where now I'm going to put everything together in the sense uh, that forest stands is one part of the forested ecosystem. There's, of course, the maintenance of biodiversity, white life, that is important in those regions. So here, when I'm saying species interaction, I'm thinking more of animal interactions in their habitat, that is forest region. So those are kind of two network and how to combine them. And we can do that with meta networks. So a meta network is a multi-layer um, network, another way is to represent it. And what it is, is let's say each panel here would be a space location. And then we look at the process of stem growing or disappearing, the dynamic of forest stem through time. And the arrows show that the intensity of relationship from one period to another. So here, the dark gr green stem is present for two time period and then disappear and another stem arrive. And there's this natural uh, turnover of stand in a forest. So this is the dynamical vision of really what the forest is, because in the previous study that I showed you, um, we uh, were looking at really one step. We didn't look at the forest dynamic uh, per se. So what are the property that we look in the meta network? Well, we want to assess uh, the top Biology, how the patch are having some weight. So like I showed you with the previous study, so we have the weight of the patch themselves and the relationship between them. Then there could be some kind of ecological processes here. I mean, more animal uh, that live in those forests or so predator and its prey. So there's dispersal movement, metapopulation, species interaction that are uh, involved. And then there's change through time. So basically the landscape at time one will have different implication of what will be the forest at time two. And that will affect, of course, the interaction with the species, um, the animal that live there. So there is a topology will influence the function of the patches and the species interaction. And the patches and the interaction will have a feedback effect on the structural components of the forest or the animal interaction. So there's a relationship between topology and function in the network. So that's bring me to oppose two different 
types of dynamics. So they could be the dynamic of the network or the network is evolving. So uh, with the Mark Dell, we call that the um, dynamic on, on the network. So let's see here, we have those patches of different qualities. So the node change uh, for a stem change. And then there's maybe animal that move from one location to another, the little arrow. So the network, there's always the same number of patches, the weight change and the movement of animal on the landscape will change. That's a dynamic system versus an evolving one where through time, uh, the number of nodes change and the number of intensity of relationship with the node are changing. So the network is evolving so is the dynamic of the network and of course it could be both that the species are moving through this evolving network so this is really what is happening in space and time so here i um, uh, want to bring to you to the animal part of the network in this case so we have this personal ability of the predator and the prey and this is the predator now will always have a kind of node in red. And this ellipse here is the dispersal ability, let's say, of predator. And usually predator move larger region. And the prey is uh, in green and there's maybe different preys and they don't disperse as much. So here already with um, another former species, uh, another former uh, student of mine, uh, we look at this in terms of uh, accessibility from a grid cell. The predator have large ability to reach different prey. Uh, so the connectivity in space and time is uh, better for the predator than for the prey. And the prey here, there's a lot of predator that can uh, get to it. So those are uh, already known, but we can put them together in what we call in ecology those kind of motif. So now we have the species interaction directly of the predator and maybe two prey that compete for the same resources. And what I'm adding here is their dispersal ability with those dash uh, circle or oval. So I want to include in the landscape, uh, not only the interaction, the traffic level, but the movement of the species. But the landscape is also not homogeneous as I showed you because of all the disturbance uh, that occur in the landscape. So we maybe need to find the uh, habitat or patches of forest that are homogeneous or for a given criteria, of course. So here, what we can do is use a uh, boundary detection or edge detection. So the one I, I present here is uh, using a Delaunay triangulation algorithm. So we have a little template and we look at the forest values and then we move the scale of the template to find boundaries locally or at large scale. So we can have this kind of edge detection and then we can delineate it. This is just a cartoon, um, maybe different tree stand types in that region, giving this edge detection. So we have our tree stand, forest stand, and then we have our little cursor of um, motif of predator prey relationship. So we can put those together. So what uh, I did here is I look at the uh, large dispersal of the predator and I use that as a template of the size at which uh, the animal the predator are needing the forest habitat that they require so now I'm having this kind of new template that is a meta network template of the forest and the uh, species interaction and I'm going to move it around to find where's the best position of what the species need and what the forest is. So here is this kind of little template 
And what is happening often through a region is that the reason why I have the boundary of forest stand in one region and another is that there are different species composition. Well, it could be the same thing for my little predator prey motif that maybe here it was mostly uh, those species that were a predator in red, whatever the species was, and two prey of gray that live in this region. And maybe in this other region is another prey, uh, another Predate, that's blue just colors and then different predate uh, pray for it so basically you could have different motif that it's the same motif of interactions but the species composition change a little bit like i was showing you the beta diversity for trees so we are changing a turnover in terms of motif and we can detect the different habitat that they need so putting all of this together, we can have this kind of species turnover in terms of motif uh, needs in the landscape that match the different patches of stem in the landscape. So basically this is a network that is dynamic because it's through space and time and species movement. So what we can see is that there is some kind of what I call the spatial network, the forest stands that has some kind of network topology that will constrain the function of the network uh, to be having more habitat, less habitat. And those functions can change um, the topology. So this is more the stand dynamic of seed dispersal and tree composition resistant to pest or drought, as I showed you. And that will constrain where the species, the animal can interact. So this is the interaction network where we have mutualist competition and predation occurring, different arrows that will have also some constraint in the function. The function can affect the topology of the network of traffic level that I showed you. And then this can again uh, modify the landscape because maybe the there's too much browsing, uh, some uh, species of prey like herbivore browse too much the forest. So there's this kind of feedback effect from one location to another. So this can be brought back to this kind of framework for forest resilience in this study with Christian Messier, uh, Nouria and others, we were not uh, including the animal component, but of course they are part of the equation in any forest and insect will be also uh, important to include in such a dynamic of modifying the landscape. So what are the key um, aspects to uh, consider when we do those network well there's the interplay between the landscape topology the forest composition the species traits that is going to affect the functional property of the network so here what is important and i have not much talk about but we need to include the temporal dimension here either by the temporal um, generation time of the trees or the animal that live in the forest, the dispersal ability of the uh, plants by uh, plantation, well, it's longer distances, but natural dispersal is not so far. The animal can disperse maybe longer distances. So this is very key if we want to develop a functional and uh, resistant management framework for forests to consider. What needs to be also considered is the um, spatial topology, the weight of the patches, the relationship, the proximity between them, the temporal uh, legacy, time lag, or extinction death. So maybe a stand is there, but if you don't uh, enrich it, it maybe will lose the property that you want as a drought resistant or pest resistant. Then there's the spatial temporal dynamic, the constraint of one. Uh, affecting the other. And of course, we need to do validation, uh, I'm a theoretician or a statistician, but maybe those things don't work. We need to make sure that uh, we can validate that the network is functioning. 
So um, basically, uh, again, I think this spatial temporal approach is a, a good way to do now is forest management to have local resistant node, the stand, and regional redundancy through the network. We have stand that are not uh, only one stand has all the property of drought, but there's a redundancy throughout the, the forest network, and that will insurance the maintenance of the forest function. So I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my co-authors and uh, um, can take some questions. Uh, wow. Um, first of all, I, I invite everyone to mute their microphone and let us give a round of applause to Mari Hauser for this very, very interesting and complete presentation. So please. Thank you very much, Mari Thank you so much, Mari Hauser. Now, if uh, any of the attendees wish to ask any question, you can unmute yourself. Also, you may write questions on the chat. All what I presented is published. So, I mean, today I didn't go in the details because I, I had more slide and I removed because it, this is way too much detail. I, I went the upper level, but of course I can answer more specific questions that people have. Please, if anyone has a question, feel free to, to just jump. I, maybe I can start with Kishi. So, yeah. um, I wonder, uh, so, yeah, see, so I, I was always interested, like, with high water interactions um, on graphs. And it seems that in your data set, and in general, in problems that you look at, I mean, this is a great example of a problem where this high water substructures will play a role. Yes, like, it's, it's not simply something like pairwise node interaction, but multiple entities interaction. And I wonder, would you have looked at the literature, for example, on using simply shell complexes um, uh, to try to analyze this data or some topological data analysis? Well, a network, all the, this, a lot of different metrics to analyze different properties. And uh, there's most of them are at the node level. So we start all about um, how connected they are. So uh, you need to have a criteria. First, you need to have patches. That's why I started to the fragmentation of the landscape. So we need patches. And um, then once you have a patch, you can see, well, how connected they are. And then the connections, you can put weight like I showed, right? So the problem is that most of the graph theory or network theory uh, have developed a lot of, lot of matrix for the nodes, um, quite a bit for the link between nodes and for the network as a whole. But the kind of three interactions or more interaction that you ask, um, well, I have this uh, former postdoc. We submit a paper, but the reviewer didn't like it. But it's used in geometry is to look mm -hmm. at the more volvex, if you want, uh, um, interactions. So that's where the field is going. There's such thing of uh, hypergraph. Um, so a hypergraph is, let's say, between my um, predator prey, there's a relationship, but because there's a relationship between them, maybe there's another relationship mm -hmm. that could exist. So there's such thing as hypergraph. Yep. Um, and that's maybe, it's not exactly what you want, but it's create a, a new set of relationship that exists only because a previous relationship exists. So there are those kind of aspects, uh, but at the end of the day is pairwise relationship and you kind of sum them to say for this node, how many pairwise do I have? This is the connectance metric or connectivity. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I mean, in addition to hypergraph, yes, so there's this, uh, this I, I, I'm very familiar with hypergraph, but you can actually use a simply shell geometry to take some subgraph analysis through. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Hopefully. maybe relate, related with uh, Julia question, sorry. Um, there was uh, also you somebody have... from, a, from, from an yeah. audience here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, okay, just briefly, uh, do you have these data sets available? I mean, the graph data sets are available, uh, am I also? Um, um, Publicly no. available? <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's a good question. Nowadays, they all ask us to put those on webs, yeah. um, but I don't know if we put the network per se or the synthetic value. Um, I could check. I don't know, to be honest. That would be interesting for a lot of people who is working in, in some sort of graph theory or, or analysis of networks. Yeah, that would be very, very interesting. Uh, let me let me uh, read one question from the audience. Uh, thanks for the presentation. This is from Slava. Uh, Slava Leobic. Um, was soil type and quality used in the analysis for three species? That's a very good question. So I presented only one study, uh, but well, since I'm a little bit early, let me um, go back then to my, um, oops. So with uh, uh, Marco Mina, another paper, we uh, look at um, what land is the same study area that with Nuria, and then we look at uh, the quality of the soil and all those other aspects. So this is um, the same spirit of what I presented, um, but with um, more tree physiology response and the soil information that we had for that study region. So we did the same thing, whoops, the other way around. Uh, we had the original data set, we projected through time with lenses, the different forest types. And then we uh, look at different climatic uh, scenario, no change in the climate, low emission, high emission. Then we have different intensity of harvesting only, harvesting, uh, insect outbreak, climate, uh, wintrow, a low in low diversity, a low intensity, sorry, high intensity. And then we did those kind of similar um, kind of functional redundancy and connectivity aspect of radar from, there was five region. So we look at those now are the five region in the study area. So this is a bit more complex, but it's published and definitely uh, in there, the soil property was definitely included more explicitly than the other uh, study that was more implicit. Thank you. Um, hope that uh, that answers the Vlava question. If, uh, if there is any other question from the audience, please, please, please jump on and let us know. Can I ask one? Yes, of course, of course, please. Yeah. So this is Hussein from South Dakota State University. So what happens to the network connectivity if you have like some eruption in your system, like when fires happens? Yes. Well, it's a little bit this time series that I show you. Some stand will disappear. So you will have a change of number of nodes right? So your graph will have change in properties. Yeah, definitely. So um, this is really the, the issue that the multi-layer um, network analysis or a meta network is crucial because you have this dynamic of patch occurrence and disappearing. And if you recall what I was presented to, presenting to you, the beta uh, diversity through time, uh, you can have it through space and time, and then you know the turnover. So, so you have this change of graph property because you don't have the same number of nodes. So that's the, always the evolving 
uh, network that I showed you instead of dynamic. The dynamic, you have always the same patch, so you can compare more easily. When you have an evolving network, you have change of property that are maybe due to the difference of node. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from the audience um, from Anna Ma Maliknotskova. Yeah. Um, did you account for temporal dependence? And if so, how? In the modeling framework, yes. Uh, because we had age of the forest, right, in the simulation. So we knew the age of each tree with lenses, the cohorts, we could do that. Um, yes, that's the um, only way that we did that in that study. Excellent. There is another question from Wu Jiang Lu. Um, thank you so much for the nice, nice talk. The data seems to be very complex and in large scales. Were there difficulties of computation in your performing the analysis? I, I bet that he refers to, you know, if big data or, you know, you needed like some extra requirements in terms of computational resources. Yes. Um, so with Nuria, that's why we went sample because she, she had to finish her PhD. So we didn't do the lenses uh, modeling aspect. With uh, Marco, we went that route and there were several computers <laughs> that were doing different simulation to be able to cope with that. Yeah, so th that's of course um, more and more an issue is to have enough computer power to perform those network matrix. And um, Nuria is just a very good uh, computer science uh, person and uh, she was able to optimize the algorithms to do the graph theory. Because you, I showed you, we had to eliminate, you could have a complete graph. So now with all those number of patches, we could have done all the link uh, between all the patches and that would have been impossible. So that's why we truncated with the dispersal ability of one kilometer. And uh, because we had enough patches and close by, that was good. But if she had done, let's say, two kilometer, uh, you know, each time you add more link and more weight, and then that would have been very difficult. So I think you need to also realize what is relevant for the study that you're, are, you're forming. Oh, excellent. Um, any other question from the audience? Uh, let me meanwhile ask ask another question. Um, uh, you have done this on simulations, right? Uh, any chance that you try to get some findings on real, you know, world? Well, the starting point was uh, definitely an initial forest where we have the real data. Um, the issue with real data with the meta network, um, that will require more <laughs> knowledge of real data. Uh, I use published data in the 2021 paper um, in Prague B in the appendix. Uh, we were looking at directional and um, more different type of measurements. Uh, with the orbits and so more complex network uh, aspect in the appendix. So I think the best of part of the paper is in the appendix because there was not enough space. Um, in you know, the word count is just a killer. Um, but I think if you're interested more in network, go to Prague B and the appendix, and then there was real data there. Thank you. Um, is there any or any other question from the audience? Okay, uh, if not, uh, we can continue the discussion after the recording. So just let me stop the recording. Okay, we can continue the discussion after after the recording.